Sandra, thank you for joining me today. Um, I am so privileged to have you here today with me for this talk. I, uh, I want to introduce you a little bit, but then I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. So today I have with me the Sandra Brown, who is the pride of Scotland. Uh, she has been around for many, many years. I have known her for good 10 years or, or around 10 years when I was doing my PhD. And I was part of the cross-party group of the uh, Scottish Parliament on adult survivors of um, childhood sexual abuse. I was the member and the secretary later. And, and Sandra was an integral part of the group. Even now she is. She is the founder of a pioneering charity in Scotland called Moira Anderson Foundation. Um, works on childhood sexual abuse issues, but we'll talk more in detail later. Sandra will tell us more about the charity. But And she has received a prestigious OBE title from the Her, Maj Her, Maj sorry, from Her Majesty for her services on child protection and childhood sexual abuse issues. So I'm, I'm just so glad and honored to have her here. I'm also privileged to be associated with Moira Anderson Foundation as a research consultant for the past two years. Again, um, a charity I love working with and, and being associated with. So thank you, Sandra. Um, so I guess I, rather than me going on and on about you, so I'm going to turn to you and ask you who Sandra Brown is. Can you just tell us something about yourself? Oh, well, um, Sandra Brown, I'm very, very privileged to have had that fabulous introduction from you, Javita. But, you know, the, the pleasure is there as well, the mutual pleasure that, you know, we're able to do this because um, I have great respect for a lot of the research that you've done and that you've got underway in Scotland and in other countries around the world about the issues of child sexual abuse, which are very, very much coming to the fore now. Um, we speak today and for instance, the lunchtime news has been full of the English Football Association looking at all the amount of abuse that's happened over many years and listening to survivors. And then the Scottish lunchtime news was looking at all the private schools such as FETUS, um, very, very um, prestigious schools that have been attended by people like Tony Blair, you know, right. former prime minister, but where child sexual abuse was very much accommodated, it wasn't dealt with, um, there were, wasn't proper safeguarding going on. So I think maybe Sandra Brown, <laughs> that you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> That public face is very much, yes, I'm associated with speaking out about the scourge that is child abuse for many years now um, and feeling like a pioneer. I mean, you used that word, but I, for a long time I did feel yes, like of course a you very are. lone voice, a lone voice in the wilderness, because in the 1990s, when I spoke about things like, um, for instance, I really believed that there were paedophile rings, that there were organized groups of people. Um, I don't think I ever used the word trafficking, but you know we know what that means now. Right. Uh, grooming wasn't even a word that was around in the 90s. So the vocabulary has really moved on greatly and, and Me Too has moved on even further, but we, we've still got a long way to go. So that that's the public face of Sandra Brown that I don't have a problem about speaking out. Thankfully, others jo joined me in this, well, well, I think it's a global problem. It's a global yeah. health issue. Yeah. Um, the personal Sandra Brown, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a grandmother. Um, I'm a very proud grandmother. And in fact, here is the latest grandchild. I can't, I can't resist this. I know. <laughs> uh, oh, beautiful. There she, there's my, my daughter with, Little baby Amaya is her name. Congratulations for that. Oh. I know you are a proud well, granny now. We cannot, we cannot wait to meet her. She is, she's actually number four. I mean, we have um two grandsons and a granddaughter who are now older, you know, they're there at school and everything. But this little lady, Amaya, is um she's in New York, and um we, we just cannot wait to cuddle her, but because of lockdown. It hasn't, you know, hopefully 
very soon, hopefully. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. I'm sure you will very soon. And I think one thing that I haven't said earlier and you haven't said, but in your introduction, people would have noticed that you are one of the most kind, compassionate, loving person I've ever met. So I'm, I'm just so proud to have met you in Edinburgh and proud to be associated with you and working with you and in, in your charity. So we'll talk more about that later. Do you want to tell me about, I think uh, I have always been very excited about your OB title and I think that's really really prestigious title that you have please tell us a little more about the OB title that you received from Her Majesty when when did you receive and what does it mean well it, it was amazing because you're, you're going back to um you know the about five years after the millennium I set the charity up in 2000 and quite out of the blue a number of accolades and awards came my way, which were very, really unexpected. As the Americans say, you know, they come out of left field. But this one really knocked me sideways. And, and I still don't know how it came about and who, who put me forward for such a prestigious award. But in 2005, I, I had been named the Scotswoman of the Year, which was to do with the the evening times, you know, the Glasgow Times, as it's known, uh, you know, a really well-known, well-established newspaper where the, the readers vote for, for women that they feel are doing quite inspirational things. Right. So that was incredible, you know, Glasgow, the big city chambers, and that was wonderful. And to realise it was people had taken the time to phone in or you know, go online or write. Good for you. That was just yeah. fabulous. But the icing on the cake was the, ne the next thing was getting an invite to Buckingham Palace. Yes. Uh, same, you know, that year, later that year. And going with my, my husband and my daughter and my son, uh, going down there. And, uh, you know, it was, it was very close to Christmas. So Buckingham Palace looked very magical with the snow and the Christmas trees inside. Oh, sure. beautiful it anyway. Was <laughs> it was amazing. And, you know, to be given this, uh, it's OBE stands for the an officer of the British Empire. And I know that the, the, the word British Empire has got other connotations where, where people you think, oh gosh, you know, this is maybe quite acronistic. You're maybe going to be back into the past. But actually what it is, it's really an acknowledgement that you have done something that helps society, you know, with, with problems. And I have to say, you know, um, Prince Charles was, he was very down to earth. And one of the things, and I don't think I've ever actually told anybody else this, Shavita, but one mm -hmm. of the things he said when he handed over and, you know, they pin the, the medal onto you, yes. is he said... Um, do you know, lots of people think I live in an ivory tower and that I don't know what is going on, but I can assure you this is a big issue. Thank goodness we have people like you who are prepared to speak out about these things. Well done. <laughs> Definitely. That's so beautiful. And um, I think you, you totally deserve that, not only for the years of service that you've put in um, the, on this issue and working on child protection, but also the personal journey and the fight of, for injustice that you had, which takes me to um, Moira, um, uh, Moira Anderson, uh, based on her um, story and your involvement, the family involvement, you set up the Moira Anderson Foundation. Um, so I don't think many people have that kind of courage to do what you've done. And that's why I think this talk is really, really inspirational and unique for me. Because when I read your book, which we'll talk about more later, also I, I thought I was watching some Hollywood film or a Bollywood film because it just doesn't sound really Real. I know we've heard cases about childhood sexual abuse. I've been working on those issues for so many years. But for someone like you facing it 
in your family and then bringing up the issue in this manner and fighting for justice and dedicating your whole life to it is extremely very inspirational uh, for me and I'm sure for all the other people. So obviously you deserve OBE and all the awards that you've had. So coming to my next question, and I think that's what people would want to know. So who's Maura Anderson and um, uh, how are you related to her? Well, I grew up in a little place called Coatbridge, um, about 10 miles outside Glasgow, um, much, much bigger now. But after the war, um, it really, really, you know, very industrial area, very working class, um, not the easiest of places to grow up, um, people with very little money, um, you know, slums, tenements, yeah, not, not, not an easy place. Moira wasn't a relative of mine, mm. but when I was eight, she was a little girl who, who disappeared. And it was a bit like in Scotland, almost like Red Riding Hood mystery, because it was in all the newspapers at the time that she'd gone out in the snow. She had a little red pixie hood that she had tied on. And her uncle sent her out because um, her grandmother, that was his mum, uh, she was very ill. At that time uh, in Scotland in 1957, this was, uh, Moira was 11, I was eight, but we had something, and you, you know, you're really chime, this will chime with you completely. Um, we had a pandemic going on then, which was called Asian flu. And people just went down like nine pins, lots of deaths. So, you know, real parallels with what we've had recently to face in the world. Um, and Moira, her gran was very, very ill and the uncle was trying to cook some food, but he didn't have anything to fry it in. So in the middle of this snowstorm, he sent his little niece out to the local store you know, the co-op, as we called them then, um, to go and get this. And she was never, ever seen again. She went into this blizzard of snow and that was it. She was a very, very pretty child. Let me show you a, a very nice drawing of her. I which, know, this is beautiful. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Can you take it a little by, back? Yeah, 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 this is nice. Yeah. yeah. This has been done by an artist um, for us recently yeah. at the charity. Yeah. And it just captures something, you know, she had a very pretty little face, she had a nice smile, yeah, um, fair yeah. hair, sort of swept back, yeah. and uh, just a, a very, very pretty and very, very talkative, very vibrant little girl, okay. uh, you know, a lively personality, uh, loved to beat the boys with marbles, excellent swimmer, um, you know, a real tomboy, we would mm -hmm. say, you know, like to run along walls or dikes and jump, <laughs> mm -hmm. swing on ropes, you know, round trees right. like be Tarzan and, you know, yeah, uh, so yeah. a real uh, loved adventures, loved yeah. adventures. And um, she was the middle of three girls. And basically her younger sister was more my age. Uh, Marjorie she was eight and I would be eight and we we didn't know each other well but we kind of you know they were they lived a few streets away and um, her older sister of the three uh, Janet she lives in Australia and she's now a great friend of, of my own and um, she supported absolutely me setting up a charity in her sister's name but yeah. that brings us to well Sandra, why would you do this? You know, yeah. this, this wee girl, she wasn't a personal friend. And she, she, she lived in a neighboring street, but you didn't yeah. really know her. You kind of knew her young sister. But why? Why yeah. would you do this? Yeah. And the reason basically is that I ended up believing that, that my father whose name was Alexander Gartshore, mm. I ended up having a conversation with him in 1992, where he, he traveled north for his, his mother's funeral. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we both attended my grandmother's funeral and there was a conversation in private and I ended up being convinced that my father had definitely abducted and I thought at that time he possibly even murdered Moira. Mm -hmm. So it was, it sounds very cheesy, corny, but it was a conversation that really changed my life. It led to me writing a book because I found that the Scottish justice system really didn't want to listen to what I was saying. So I ended up in 1990, let me think, 98, this mm -hmm. was published. Um, but it took a few years to write, obviously, in the mid 90s. And here it is, I called it um, Where There Is Where Evil. There is evil right. It is based on how this all started with a conversation that, you know, that I had with, with my father. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's been a very hard journey. Um, what came out of the woodwork was that my cousins, many of my female cousins had been abused by my father but had not been able to speak up, okay. or if they had spoken up, they had not been believed. Nothing had happened to me, uh, not on a, a sexual level, physically, physically, yes. He was a, a very, very tall man, a man of about six foot four. So uh, I'll show you um, a picture. Uh, just, just check if I've got a picture there. Um, no, I'll find I'll find one for you later. Um, yeah, do send it to me. I saw the picture with of you with your father in the Daily Record news article, which is out ah, uh, recently. Right. I saw that's, that one. So, yeah, that's a very small picture, which I don't know if we'd see easily in the screen, but I'll send that to you sure. so that you can see what what he looked like when when I was just that eight year old that I was talking to you about. But very very tall, very imposing man, and. He was a local bus driver, which, uh, as you know, in, in your own culture, anybody with a uniform tends to be given a, a lot of respect. Right. And uh, there is a kind of trust, I think, that that often is shown by, by people, you know, like towards police officers, train drivers, bus drivers, that they are going to be OK, safe people. And, you know, sadly, when you're a child, you, you don't have the, off you don't have the life skills to work out your, you know, your intuitive feelings are maybe not honed as well. You know, later on, if you get bad vibes, we would say about someone, you know, you're very careful. But when you're very young, your, your gut feelings, they're quite confusing. Right. And, you know, basically, bus drivers then, were very trusted because they were on school buses as well. Right. Parents would get on and off and say hello. You know, very often people in the 1950s in Coat Bridge would actually give drivers boxes of sweets and biscuits as a thank you for driving them somewhere. Right. That, yeah. That's how naive people were. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So he was a bit of a, a well-known figure in the community. And, you know, what I'm saying is he had some respect which had not been earned. It was more to do with his, his standing. And I think what you and I both know is that sexual predators use these kind of things like their right. cap, a peat cap, or yeah. their braid, or their brass buttons. They are very good masks of power. And mm. he had power. And he also was able to ensure he had friends in the community who would cover up some of his behavior that was less than safe. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra, for sharing all that. Uh, I, I think uh, I would like to end this segment here. You've given us a good background about what's happened. But in the next segment, I would like to explore 
everything that you've said further. So about that conversation you had with your father, which led to your suspicion about him being linked to Moira's missing and, and her murder. And also, how did you make links to sexual assault? Because if I understand correctly, um, at the time when Moira went missing, he was already undergoing a case for sexual assault of a 13 year old girl and he was yeah, on bail. And that is important. That's important because really the audience then realized like, oh, she's made this huge leap. Exactly. But if they know that actually- <laughs> There was more there already. Yeah, so that's what I would like to explore more. Uh, I shall go you. and get a cup of tea. <laughs> yes, you go and get your cup of tea. I will oh, tell oh, my oh, audience. Oh, Always it feels like, you know, when I do start talking, whether it's a pleasant sunny day, which it is here, our heating's on, but always I get a, a cold feeling. So I know, yeah, I know. cup of tea will do the trick. Yes, that, we, that we go ahead tea. and get your cup of tea. And I will tell my audience that we will continue this conversation in the next segment. So please do subscribe to the channel and come back and listen to the next segment. Um, thank you for now.